it's another late night edition of Sundry Sports for Friday, July 10th. Uh, Cowboys Wire brought to you by USA Today, Cowboys News, O Lines Rank, Gregory's Hold Up, CD's Legacy. That sounds new, so we will click on that. I'm liking this new trend of Cowboys Wire actually putting something new in the top spot. Hope it keeps up. The Great Wall of Dallas is still standing strong, according to one respected outlet. The great cornerback debate rages on, and the great deadline to a Dak Prescott deal hasn't changed despite Patrick Mahomes resetting the market. I really don't want to have to talk about that again. Oh yeah, and this just in. CeeDee Lamb was pretty great in college. Like, historically great. The Cowboy star rusher did some good for needy Dallas's fam for needy Dallas families, and the team's top pass rusher did some good for needy Dallas families. Oh, the team's top pass rusher. I got distracted. Did some good back home by signing up folks in his hometown to vote. All that plus a look at the Cowboys starting five, a look at which Cowboys are poised for com- comeback campaigns, and a West Coast mayor is California dreaming about America's team coming back to Oxnard. Well, next year, hopefully. Here comes the news and notes. NFL Offensive Line Rankings. All 32 units entering the 2020 NFL season. Pro Football Focus. The Cowboys' front five is seemingly always among the league's best. Yep. Despite losing Travis Frederick and factoring in some uncertainty about Connor Williams, the O-line still ranks third overall in PFF's list going on going into 2020. Chris Richard wasn't the only Cowboys coach to favor Anthony Brown over Jordan Lewis. Prior to Chris Richard, who joined the coaching staff in 2018, Matt Eberflus, Eberflus? and Joe Baker also favored Anthony Brown over Jordan Lewis. Why the Dallas Cowboys' Dak Prescott deadline hasn't changed. Tom Ryle of Blogging the Boys breaks down how, even with Patrick Mahomes getting a record-setting deal, it doesn't change things for the Cowboys and Dak Prescott. Thank you. It shouldn't. I hope that's what he says, because it really shouldn't. Three moves the Cowboys should make, but won't. Dallas can do without a traditional fullback on the roster. Oh, what about, um, Rod Smith? I thought he was a fullback. Do we not have Rod Smith anymore? John Oning discusses eliminating the traditional fullback, creating competition for punter Chris Jones. Don't do that. I like Chris Jones. And signing a capable swing tackle as three moves the Cowboys should make. Oh. Cowboys' Ezekiel Elliott, over COVID, donates $85,000 to families in need. In person and wearing a mask. Even though now he's over it, he really doesn't have to because he's got the antibodies. This is madness. The star running back made good on a spring promotion of exclusive merchandise and delivered a giant check to a Dallas-area food bank. The funds will help over 400,000 families in need during the coronavirus panic. What's the holdup in Randy Gregory's reinstatement request? Gregory officially applied for reinstatement back in March. After four months, why hasn't there been a decision? Good question, but possibly the NFL just doesn't want him back. CeeDee Lamb. Retweeting something from FanDuel. CeeDee Lamb's numbers at Oklahoma were right up there with the best wide receivers in college football history. Number fire goes deep on CD3. That's CD Lamb's handle, including his fantasy and prop bet projections for the 2020 season. Elite company. Player and average yards per reception in college. Marvin Harrison is at the top with 20.2. CD Lamb is just under him at 19. Nice. Good for him. Michael Irvin. Randy Moss is number three, Tim Brown, Tori Holt, Steve Largent, and then Michael Irvin, 16.9. Larry Fitzgerald, Keyshawn Johnson, 
Mike Evans, Des Bryant, 16.5. Calvin Johnson, Odell Beckham Jr., 16.4. Oh, Des Bryant had better number. A point, point one, point one average yard better than Odell Beckham Jr. Bucky Brooks' top five starting fives in the NFL. The network analyst examines each team's primary playmakers. Say hello to Elliott, Pollard, Cooper, Gallup, and Lamb in the number five spot. That sounds that sounds good. I mean, I haven't seen Lamb play yet, but uh, obviously he's good. Dak Prescott among top earners in NFL Players Association group licensing. The Cowboys quarterback finished fourth among NFL players in royalties for 2019. Yep. NFL player from Aiken County gives out masks at voter registration drive. Dude. DeMarcus Lawrence got some love from his local news station after he returned home to South Carolina to hand out masks and help register citizens to vote over the July 4th weekend. That's Independence Day, y'all. Um, okay, cool about the voting thing, but... Because... I'm so I'm so over this. So tired of this. Oxnard Mayor confident the Dallas Cowboys will be back again. I'm sure they will. Coronavirus precautions are keeping the Cowboys in Frisco for 2020's training camp, but the outgoing mayor of their summer home believes America's team will keep coming back to Cali. Ravens announced attendance cap for 2020. What about Cowboys? The Baltimore Ravens will allow their home stadium to be under 20% full this fall. That is super tiny. That's a small number. In a stadium? Everybody's going to be more than six feet apart. Probably. That same percentage would make for an awfully intimate crowd in Jerry World. Oh, but it wouldn't be intimate because everybody would be spread out, so... Nope. Hitman, Hitman, contract killer, well, Collins is Cowboys' best offensive tackle. Who saw that coming? What? Dallas Cowboys still have an abundance of wealth along the offensive line, even with the retirement of Travis Frederick. Truth be told, the center, something, blah, blah, blah. Best offensive tackle currently. I'm guessing this isn't a, this, like a historical thing. Cowboys news, Patrick to Prescott correlation, COVID protocols, Des no call. Did I read this already? Patrick Mahomes new deal leads to Cowboys and Dak Prescott contract prediction. Nope. Cowboys wire the Patrick Mahomes contract, reset the quarterback market, blah, blah, blah. Cowboys are next, blah, 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 blah. Whatever. Whatever. Ravens announced attendance cap. Yep, just read about that. Uh huh. Player opt outs for cowards. Blah, blah, blah. Dontari Poe, the arrogant one. It's not just him. I know. Yes, training camp at home instead of Oxnard. ESPN Daily. Good morning. The NFL's ban of jersey exchanges for the upcoming season due to COVID-19 concerns feels about as silly as when my parents told a younger me that I couldn't watch The Mummy, even though I had already watched I Know What You Did Last Summer at my grandmother's house. Here's your ESPN Daily. Well, at least somebody knows that one COVID rule is silly. You can do better than that, girl. Blackfeet boxing, not invisible. It has been called an invisible epidemic. On reservations across North America, Native American women are missing or murdered in rates ten times higher than the general population. But on one reservation, the women are learning to fight back, literally by stepping into the boxing ring. Cool. Yes, women should learn to fight. That's really nothing new. <sighs> 
On Mant Montana's Blackfoot Reservation, the Blackfeet Nation Boxing Club teaches young women how to defend themselves both inside and outside the ring. It all chronicled, it's all chronicled in a new documentary, Blackfeet Boxing, Not Invisible, from ESPN Films. On today's episode of the ESPN Daily Podcast, Kristen Lapis, who directed the documentary, reflects on her experiences in making the film, which airs at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time, Sunday on ABC. Then, former NFL offensive lineman Jeff Schwartz shares his thoughts on Deshaun Jackson's recent anti-Semitic social media posts. Posts? Like, like plural? Because I only saw that one that was a fake, quote, a fake quote from Hitler. Did he post multiple fake quotes from Hitler? UFC 251. It's on at Fight Island. After months of unknowns and endless hype, Fight Island... Uh, uh, yawn. I'm sorry. Fight Island is super exciting. Fight Island is finally happen happening this Saturday, 10 p.m. Eastern Time on ESPN+. The UFC, after already having completed eight events during the coronavirus panic, is promising even tighter health and safety protocols on Abu, Abu Dhabi's Yas Island. Yas. <laughs> In addition to undergoing significantly more testing than the UFC has done so far, those involved in the four events this month will be relegated to a safe zone where members of the general public will not be allowed. All those contained in the safe zone, including local workers and the UFC's traveling party, will be tested for COVID-19 several times. Generally, people in the contained area will not have in-and-out privileges, it's going to be the tightest bubble that you could sort of ever produce, UFC COO Lawrence Epstein told ESPN. It's a pretty unique situation on an island with incredible controls over who's coming in and not letting people come back in once they've left. The presence of a true bubble is one of the biggest differences between the shows in the United States and those being held this month in Abu Dhabi. All right, now that we have the how and safety part of this equation sorted out, let's get into what's about to go down in the octagon. Just one week ago, Jorge Masvidal was home in Florida. The UFC 251 main event was supposed to pit welterweight champion Kamaru Usman against contender Gilbert Burns, but things changed very quickly, as they do sometimes in MMA and, you know, in the midst of a panic. The promotion agreed to a multi-fight deal with Masvidal to f have him fight Usman for the belt on just six days' notice. And thus, the biggest question coming in. How prepared is Masvidal? Usman vs. Masvidal was the fight the UFC originally tried to make before an extended contract dispute with Masvidal. Five weeks ago, those talks fell apart and Masvidal did not complete a full training camp. Actively training or not, defeating Usman will not be an easy t task. Usman, 16-1, has never lost in the UFC and is on a streak of 11 straight victories. Masvidal, 35 and 13, on the other hand, is getting his first UFC title shot after 48 career fights, the second highest total for UFC title fight debu debutant. The second highest total for UFC title fight debutant. UFC 251 will feature two other title fights as well. Alexander Volkanovsky will put his featherweight belt on the line against the man he beat at UFC 245, Max Holloway. Former featherweight champion Jose Aldo will face, oh, I don't know this name, so I don't know what the next letter is, Pe something Jan, for the vacant bantamweight title, with the chance for Aldo to become just the eighth fighter in UFC history to win titles in two weight classes. ESPN asked some of the MMA's leading coaches, as well as some fighters with knowledge of the athletes, to weigh in on the upcoming bouts. Kamaro Usman, his father, and a Texas prison. Kamaro, Kam Kamaru? Is it Kamaru or is it Kamaru? Kamaru Usman? Kamaru Usman's father has never seen one of his son's MMA bouts in person, but he has rarely missed a fight. Over the past seven years, Muhammad Nasiru Usman turned UFC fights into appointment viewing for the inmates at the Federal Correctional Institution in Seagoville, Texas. Seagoville? I've never heard of that place. Almost every time UFC welterweight Usman fought, the minimum security satellite camp turned into a full-fledged cheering section. All six televisions, which the inmates usually divided, were turned to the UFC broadcast. 
I honestly can't say there was anything else we looked forward to more, says D. Ray, an inmate in 2007-13 to and 2017-20. to Nothing could replace that. That was a time when everyone came together, black, white, and Mexican, and enjoyed the festivities. It kind of put us in the arena, so to speak. We didn't think about what we were going through during that time. Those fight nights were special in Seagoville, and the undefeated Usman never let them down. Unbeknownst to his father, Kamaru had asked the UFC not to book him on pay-per-view as he knew the Seagoville prison camp wouldn't purchase a pay-per-view for his father. But now, Kamaru's father is out. While Muhammad can't accompany his son to Fight Island, he knows he will someday experience his son's MMA career in person. That's nice. What was he in prison for? I'm curious. Business is booming for Holloway, Inc. Over the past 18 months, I'm going to yawn again. Over the past 18 months, Max Holloway's life has undergone a dramatic makeover. Rather than a one-man operation, he's more like a sports franchise. Holloway's medical and nutrition plans were overhauled, his financial planning was streamlined, a corporation was set up, and Holloway the fighter was put on salary to promote savings and investments. The idea was to take the distractions out of Holloway's day-to-day -day life and have him concentrate solely on training and fighting. The problem is you're you got to make sure that you're choosing the right people to manage your stuff because you could be taken advantage of. Uh, Christopher Daggett, his manager, would be the general manager and Holloway would, could lean into being the star player. Before, I was the CEO, the CFO, the broker, the 28-year-old Holloway said. Whatever you want to name it, name it as a role, the franchise, the role of the franchise, I was it. And the player. Now I'm just the player. They're not taking anything away from me. They didn't demote me in any way. I just get to focus on fighting now. So what prompted this seismic shift in how Holloway operates? From the White House to the Toronto Raptors. Here's the story of Holloway, Inc. Okay. Weekend binge reads. Meet the NBA's Bubble Barbers. One bubble, six barbers, for as unusual. Uh, uh, sorry. For as unusual as the NBA's bubble will be, the league and the National Basketball Players Association are making a concerted effort to provide aspects of normality, such as a players-only lounge with NBA 2K, TVs, arcade gaming, and ping pong. There are resort-style outdoor spaces with shade, a setup for card games and pool access, there are trails for running or riding bikes, and yes, there will be six barbers, three stylists, and three manicurists on set. So how did the aforementioned six barbers go about landing one of the coveted spots? It all came down to experience, familiarity, and Ray, Rayjean, Rayhan, Rayjean Rondo's brother. This sign says, I've always used basketball to try to bring people together. Today, I feel, is a day we need that most. I have hand sanitizer if you'd like to play. Stephanie. Stephanie? Stephanie? Hoop streams. Making a career out of playing sports used to be reserved for those with superior athletic abilities, but the internet is changing all that, and the burgeoning sports community of original content creators continues to grow. Social media stars like Steph Stefania. Oh, Stefania E. Like Stefania Ergem Ergemlitz, Ergemlitz provides a glimpse into a new future. Growing up with physical disability and having never with a physical disability and having never played organized basketball, Ergemlitz never envisioned a path where she could turn her passion for hoops into a way to make money and be a voice for positivity within her community. That is until she started doing it following the killing of George Floyd and protests emerging across the country. Protests. Ergam Leeds wanted to find a way to unite people on the streets, so she took a basketball hoop she had and traveled to Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, and Minneapolis at the heart of the protests emerging around the country. And apparently had a sign. Things to watch. Canelo versus Curry. Steph Curry don't want no smoke. Curry and Canelo Alvarez engaged in a makeshift sparring session during a recent golf outing, and just one jab from the middleweight champ was all it took for Curry to, wisely, abort the fake boxing match. 
Canelo threw a hand so quick that it shocked Curry into stumbling a bit. Then, to add insult to injury, someone off-camera shouted, Steph, you're supposed to move, dude. <laughs> it's okay, Steph. Just wait until he has to meet you at the three-point line. Hmm. Overheard. I am proud of my Jewish heritage, and for me, it is not just about religion. It's about community and culture as well. Anti-Semitism is one of the oldest forms of hatred. It's rooted in ignorance and fear. Julian Edelman on Deshaun Jackson's anti-Semitic social media posts. Remember when? On this date in 1999, Brandy Chastain scored the winning shootout goal in the Women's World Cup final. You might remember it for her instantly iconic celebration that involved ripping off her jersey and whipping it around her head like Petey Pablo. Er, a lariat. Okay. Until next time, remember... Joel Embiid, departing for the NBA's Orlando bubble wearing a hazmat suit, gave me strong Heisenberg from Breaking Bad vibes. It also felt like a look Cam Newton would have accessorized nicely. This has been your ESPN Daily for Friday, June 10th, 2020. All right. That's it for ESPN. Oops. One more. We have Yahoo Sports Read and React. Brought to you by Yahoo Sports. Trending. Court documents allege $400,000 payment to Zion before he played at Duke. Uh-oh. J.J. Watt says he may not play in 2020 if NFL requires face shields. Hmm. That kind of reasoning isn't cowardice, but I don't know. I don't know. Don't require face shields. I feel like it might hinder breathing a little bit. Tiger Woods is back, y'all. And we dare you not to read this. Betting on Ukrainian ping pong halted in New Jersey over match-fixing concerns. Why are New Jerseyans betting on Ukrainian ping pong? That's intriguing. The lead. What we're looking forward to in sports return. Okay. Bye, Jay Busby. Good morning, friends. Today we're going to traffic in hope. When I played Little League Baseball, I led the league in getting hit by pitches. This is absolutely true. I did anything I could to get on base, and in those days, the easiest way was to lean into a pitch, suffer the thud, and then take first. Okay. I always walk to the batter's box with a sense of dread. How much will this hurt? Does this kid throw with any heat? Will this one catch me in the teeth? This is pretty much how I feel every morning now as I open up Twitter on my phone. I know whatever I read in the news is going to hurt. It's just a question of how much. So today, I'm going to bring you something to read that hopefully won't hurt. You can dwell on the bad news. There's plenty of that both above and below these words. But just for a second, let's see if we can get positive. We know that one day, sports will come back. Full stadiums, predictable schedules, anticipation rather than dread looming in the air. I can't wait, and I'm sure neither can you. Here are just a few things I'm looking forward to when sports return. The moment that the kickoff is in the air. That surge in a stadium you feel when the home team batter rips into a pitch and it's headed for the deep bleachers just before the crowd explodes in celebration. The first thump-thump of bass drums and the first cry of trumpets on a college football Saturday. The moment when the pace car peels off the track and the cars race toward the green flag. The taste of an ice-cold beer while standing alongside a green, waiting for that pairing down the fairway to approach. The look on a kid's face when a star gives them their shoes or plays catch or hands them a touchdown ball. The look on a parent's face when a kid throws a foul ball back onto a field. <laughs> <laughs> That instant when you've got the tailgate completely and perfectly set up and you can sit down in your chair and enjoy the smell of meat on the grill. The Monday night game where your fantasy team's third wide receiver goes for three touchdowns and 150 yards and you pull out an upset win. The seventh game of any playoff hockey series. The seventh game. The final possession of a one-possession basketball game. Baseball in late October. Football in the snow. 
High fives, bro hugs, embraces, champagne celebrations, hyper intricate handshakes, and piles of delirious celebration at midcourt, the end zone, home plate, just good old human contact. Is human contact going to come back? Sometimes I wonder. People. People and their fear. I just. People and their fear and their, their uh, oxymoronical new normal. It just makes me wonder. Crowds, loud, raucous, cheering, booing, hugging, fighting, glorious crowds. I want us all back in the stadium as soon as we can get there. How about you? What are you looking forward to in sports return? Let me know. Meantime, I'll try to keep focusing on the positives down the line and hope tomorrow morning's fastball doesn't catch me in the ribs. Stay safe, everyone. See you Monday. Oz. Umpire Joe West ought to sit out the 2020 MLB season. Because he's old and apparently overweight. Yeah, possibly. Wetzel, this douchebag. Big Ten's new conference-only plan is a troubling sign. Huh. Bushnell, what's it like inside the MLS bubble? The inside story. That's Major League Soccer, I guess. Better Man, in case there was any doubt that Pearl Jam's Eddie Vedder is one of our greatest living rock stars. Huh. Here he is wakeboarding while pulling off a trick shot for Snowy Strong. Hashtag Snowy Strong. I don't know what that means. Everything's changed and absolutely nothing's changed. Okay. Who threw the ball? Are they on a boat? Or is somebody else on a surfboard throwing the ball? That is a surfboard. No, a wakeboard. Okay, so they're on a boat. Sorry. I was. It looks like a surfboard. Thanks for reading today's issue of Read and React. Follow Yahoo Sports on social. And that's it for tonight. Thank you and goodbye.